Hey, welcome back everybody. Uh, Richard Farley, Deputy Editor, 442 USA, here for the second week in a row, the second week of what will hopefully be many weeks, uh, joining you here on Facebook Live talking women's soccer. Um, gonna give people a few minutes to come as we've just put the links out there. Uh, FYI, you can always send your questions to us via Twitter. And then once this appears in the feed on Facebook, of course, uh, definitely hit us up there. We can talk about um, anything this week. It's a women's soccer, uh, U.S. Women's National Team week. So we're between games against New Zealand. U.S. Women won on Friday 3-1. to one. Um, Decent performance, uh, decent New Zealand team. Two first half goals from Julie Ertz. Uh, sent the game cruising. Hannah Wilkinson got a goal in the second half that made things dicey for a little bit. And then Alex Morgan with a tremendous finish towards the end to put the game out of doubt. Um, again, um, I'm stalling a little bit here because I'm getting the Facebook screen up so I can see which questions you guys uh, are sending me. But uh, U.S. Women's National Team going to concentrate on that for probably the first half of the chat today. And then we're going to switch into a w National Women's Soccer League talk. Uh, a lot of you may have noticed that earlier this morning we put out a article detailing some troubles that they're having at FC Kansas City. We'll talk about that more in the second half of this chat, but uh, the troubles go beyond FC Kansas City. Um, other teams in the league, we mentioned Seattle and Boston specifically have issues, but the political dy dynamic behind the scene, how that affects expansion, how that affects potential relocation, new owners in the league, uh, that's all things that we'll be discussing. We've got a lot of questions on that. In fact, we've got more questions on that than we do the women's national team. Uh, but let's go ahead and talk about the women's national team as I look down here at my iPad to get some of the questions that have come in. Um, I think people probably thought it was a very straightforward, maybe a little bit of a reassuring performance against New Zealand. The results probably don't matter as much as just what we saw as far as Jill Ellis' selection, the formation, how that formation played, what that formation means for the future. Uh, yesterday on the site, John Halloran talked a little bit about the influence Julie Ertz can have in that de defensive midfield role. And it's something on the site we've been talking about all year, about just how tremendous and uh, how forceful she is ever since she's moved into that role for the Red Stars. And pretty much since that happened, this exact midfield trio is one that I've wanted to see. Uh, what we see from Julie Ertz, the big virtue there is just her her pure presence means you really don't have to play two players at that level of the field to protect the defense. You don't have to play, you know, two holders, a double pivot. You can move Samantha Mewis forward and allow her to have her influence higher up the field. And for me personally, I, I really like trying Lindsey Horan there because the trio of Julia Ertz, Samantha Mewis, Lindsey Horan, those are three very versatile, very robust midfielders. And while you sacrifice a little bit of creativity, I think Lindsey Horan can do a lot of that when you're sacrificing what would be a normal number 10, a, a Carly Lloyd type role, or a lot of people want to see Rose Lavelle in there. Uh, and I think that's just a strength of the national team. I think the main competition that the national team has, the teams like Japan and Germany and France, this is the type of midfield that would really, really give them trouble. And while it may not be the the quickest midfield, or uh, technically maybe it's not going to be as adept as some of the French players, this builds on the U.S.'s strength and something that we'll have later in the week on the site. It also ends this quest to manufacture a number 10 where, for some reason in our soccer culture, both on the men's and women's sides, we're not producing number 10s. Our skilled players are going wide. The Megan Rapinos, the Tobin Heats, uh, Rose Lavelle, I think, is going to have her biggest impact in a wide role. So rather than continue to try to manufacture that, I think we should play to our strengths. And so I'm really interested to see how this uh, this formation turns out. Um, going to questions about the U.S. Women's National Team, we'll take those first and then a lot of questions um, from other people about, uh, the, about the NWSL. We'll get to those in the second half of the chat. But um, Whitney DeWall was one of the first people who sent in a question this week. She asked, I'm not, I'm not going to watch the video, thanks Whitney, but please discuss a reason why Morgan and Press shouldn't get 10 games of 90 minutes together to make it work. We're missing out on what could be one of the best strike partnerships of all time because we don't try it consistently. Uh, obviously, this is something that has been talked about at length amongst U.S. Women's National Team fans, and for good reason. Uh, the best reasons are that 
Kristen Press and Alex Morgan are spectacular players. And for some reason, they haven't really been tried together, or at least they haven't been tried together where Kristen Press is playing her natural role. Uh, we saw a lot of minutes in the previous cycle or the second half of the previous cycle where Kristen Press was kind of wedged into a wing position. And uh, she wasn't bad there, but anybody who had seen Kristen Press playing in Sweden or those people that had formed their opinion about Kristen Press from her time at Stanford knew that wasn't her natural position. Now we go into this cycle and it seems like those two are competing for a spot and uh, I'm not necessarily sure that has to be the case. I think Kristen Press's all-around game allows her to drop back from the number nine position, give that to Alex Morgan, who can continue to push the defense and threaten behind the line, while Kristen Press goes into the hole, or we see a lot for Chicago, she has this tendency to go out wide left, win a ball, hold a play, um, find Vanessa DiBernardo or Sofia Huerta, and then trail the play and be effective from there. I would love to see that. I would love to see her coming to the left, winning a ball, hitting a Morgan behind the right back, and using that space that Alex Morgan creates. Uh, I don't know why we're not seeing it. I think 10 games at 90 minutes each, it's probably a big ask given how often the national team plays or how frequently they play too, but I think the whole fan base would like to see that tried out for whatever reason it hasn't been. One thing we did on the site last week that was uh, rightly controversial is we ranked the forwards from the national team pool. And uh, I shouldn't say we, I have to take responsibility for that. Uh, mostly putting Alex Morgan forth, uh, something that has quickly looked even weirder than it did at the time. I have to admit, when I was sitting down and I was doing those rankings, I had Press 1, Carly Lloyd 2. We ranked her as a forward just because that's where she's projecting going forward. Uh, Crystal Dunn 3 and Alex Morgan 4. And I felt really weird about it because as I was making those rankings, I mean, this is how ordinal rankings work. I knew in my mind that Morgan was way closer to number one in my mind than she was number five. But when you rank her at four, people aren't going to see that. And you know, you, you have to live with that a little bit. For me, Alex Morgan's last two months have been the best play of any player in the national team pool, period. But you look at the previous year and a half or so, and you look at um, her play at club level ever since 2013, and there are questions. For me, she's quickly resolving those questions, not only because of her increased production, but the way that she is doing it, uh, the things that she wanted to accomplish by going to France early on, uh, early on this year. I think that it's an incredibly admirable thing for anybody to take their profession and recognize where they need to improve and tackle that straight on. I mean, I don't, I don't think I would do that, um, but she has, and I think that she has been much better for it. Um, and so in a couple of months time, I can see myself ranking Alex Morgan number one, if not just a couple of weeks time. I think the top four are just that close. Um, Jackie Guerrero on uh, Facebook says, what's going on with goalkeeping? Is Nair having a few bad games or does she need more time and pressure situations to up her game? So let's go back to part of the impetus for this question, not only her big gaffe during the Tournament of Nations, but also what we saw on Friday where she didn't come out for that ball that bounced in the box and she had, she had plenty of time to get there. And while that's not a play every goalkeeper is going to make, uh, and that's not a play that you would definitely say, oh, listen Nair, it's 100% at fault for that. At this level of the game, you want your goalkeepers to be elite and you want them to be able to erase uh, erase errors because you know that there are other goalkeepers that will. Um, and Alyssa Nair needs to make that play because there are other player goalkeepers in the pool that would have. Now, would it have been better for uh, Kelly O'Hara to read that ball a little bit better or Becky Sauerbrunn to react to that? Or uh, we saw that same cross come in later in the game again from that side, and maybe that was Sofia Huerta at right back, her first game, or uh, the lack of a wide presence from the midfield there. There are a lot of excuses, but you want your goalkeeper to make up for that. I, I mentioned this in an article recently, and it's something that's been on my mind really ever since it was mentioned to me this summer uh, by Becky Sauerbrunn. She was taught early on in her pro career that goals happen when two mistakes come together. Goalkeepers are the ones that should prevent that second mistake, and I think um, I think Alyssa Nair, Nair hasn't. I think she still looks like she's the number one goalkeeper in the pool. I think it'd be interesting if Ashlyn Harris got a start tonight. I also think it would be interesting if this fall somebody like Adriana French gets called up. Um, we saw Abby Smith get multiple call-ups earlier this year. I think all of those players need to be kept in mind. Uh, I think one thing I fear, and I mentioned this in last week's chat, is that Jane Campbell is going to start uh, locking down that number three spot, and I don't think that does anybody a service. Um, one question from Twitter from Colleen. What happened to Klingenberg on the national team roster? And 
that's her, her first question. Let's go ahead and deal with that first. I think I think she's just being beaten out for her spot at this point. Uh, we talked a little bit last week about the changing dynamics of the fullback position, and I think Megan Klingenberg uh, is not necessarily meeting that standard. I think she's had a really good year for the Thorns, but it has been a year that has been heavily lopsided to her play going forward. And as we mentioned last week, a lot of teams are tar- used to target the Thorns down that side before the Thorns went to three center backs and uh, made that less of an issue. And I think that's something that you have to accept with Megan Klingenberg. Um, I don't think it's out of the question that she can play her way back into the pool. But right now, uh, I think that Jill Ellis is happy with what she's seen from Taylor Smith. Uh, Kelly O'Hara, we know, is going to be there. Casey Short has established herself. And now we see Sofia Huerta uh, making her de- debut at right back. So I think it's going to be a little bit hard for Megan Klingenberg. And uh, we talked about it last week. Allie Krieger's of the world, too. Uh, they're both very quality players. Uh, I think Krieger, Krieger's... Exclusion from the roster is a little bit more mysterious, but they are being excluded. Um, so Lace Larson says, middle of the park, what's our central midfield plan? Players and structure. So we talked about it a little bit before in this chat, but let's go back to Tournament of Nations where Jill Ellis was starting a 4-4-2 predominantly, something that she had evolved to ever since the experiments with the three back earlier in the year. And then she kind of settled on that 4-4-2 where she would switch to a 4-3-3 in games, and that actually proved to be the more effective formation. So now it looks like during this break, she's going to try that 4-3-3. Uh, but of course, all 4-3-3s aren't created equal. What we saw on Friday, it, it's and again, I'm biased towards this because I have wanted to see this trio for a long time because it really reminds me of, from the men's side, those great midfields that Jose Mourinho had, where he had... Claude McAuley ball winning, and then he had Michael Essien and Frank Lampard in the midfield, and it was just incredibly robust and dominant midfield, and I think the U.S. has the players to do that. Um, that shape would have 1-6 and basically 2-8s where um, Sam Mewis projects more as a box-to-box, and then Lindsey Horan would be the first one to get forward. We can see different combinations of that, too. Morgan Bryan's ability to connect play through the midfield and her decision-making are great. Ali Long's efficiency and distribution has been much talked about. So those are really two good options to change things up. And if they want to have somebody that's more of a pure 10, they can always inject Carly Lloyd in there too. I'm going to talk about these things later in the week on the site, but this is a huge reason why I think this formation has to be a a go going forward. And even more than that, just the in-game flexibility. You think about the ability to push your center backs forward so they're even with Julie Ertz, make that into a three center back, push forward the fullbacks into wingback positions, and then Jill Ellis has an option to solve some of the problems that she was trying to solve by going to a pure three-back scheme in the spring. So just that that flexibility alone, along with the ability to plug Carly Lloyd in and make that midfield three into a diamond, which she has played so well at Houston, the spear of that diamond, I think there's just so many virtues to this beyond just the core skills of those three midfielders that I really like in that position. Um, let's see, uh, Jackie again from, uh, from Facebook, and then we'll switch to the NWSL talk after this. Um, we're only a few months away before 2018 when we enter qualifiers. Are we ready? Yeah, we're, we're ready for CONCACAF qualifiers. Um, no disrespect to Canada, Mexico, Costa Rica, all teams that are improving, um, teams that could give the U S trouble on any given day, but the U S is ready for those qualifiers. And, um, even to the extent that they had trouble qualifying in 2011, uh, that now looks like a fluke. Um, yeah, those games can happen, but the U S is absolutely ready. And, um, you know, I think New Zealand is probably, if they were in CONCACAF, they would be probably the third best team in this region. And we saw that the U S had a pretty comfortable time against them. So let's switch over to the NWSL. Now, uh, we talked on the site this morning about what's going on at FC Kansas city, uh, to have a brief 15 second summary. Things there aren't looking great. There are concerns about whether the team is uh, meeting minimal standards. We've had sources told us about multiple areas in which they haven't met standards. Uh, One that everybody can see is that they're not traveling with the required number of players. And while we see that occasionally in NWSL NWSL from teams, it's usually one-offs. Kansas City has made a pattern of that. And then they also slipped before the league's minimum uh, salary threshold at points this year. Um, Should be said that both the league and the team deny that, um, but we feel really confident in our sourcing on that. Um, just overall, there's an atmosphere in Kansas City that the club isn't uh, really meeting the expectations or uh, creating an environment where people want to play and stay. I think 
one thing that we've heard constantly from a lot of people is that the one thing keeping that team together is the relationship that the squad and Vladko Adonofsky have built um, through their two championships and just generally how Vladko treats players. Uh, Vladko has developed a, a self-admitted reputation as being very loyal to players that he feels like he can improve. He feels like that's his debt to the players. They give their time. Uh, they don't get incredibly compensated. He gives them the chance to improve and make a career. A uh, couple people, and I think Vlaco even admitted, admitted this to me earlier this year, is that a weakness of his is that he doesn't give up on players maybe as soon as other teams would. He'll keep them around, and if he sees a future for them that shows improvement, he'll stick with them. Uh, and while that might not might cost him a few points in the standings each year, it engenders a ton of loyalty. Um, if Vladko wasn't there, I think a lot of the team wouldn't be there. And I think even with Vladko there, there are a lot of players that if things don't improve are not going to be in Kansas City next year um, from the top of the roster to the bottom. Now, as far as improvements, we talked about a potential sale. Uh, according to sources, there is a new ownership group lined up. Uh, how far that is along, it's not so far along that the current ownership group couldn't salvage things, but uh, the current we're pretty far along into the season and these problems have persisted all along, so they're pretty far down that road. Uh, the more enticing option is Sporting KC getting involved. Uh, Sporting KC has been rumored with an NWSL dalliance since, since 2012, the end of 2012 when this league was first forming. Um, but much for me, it's a situation that also parallels the situation in Salt Lake with um, Real Salt Lake, who have strong interests in the NWSL, but they also have a USL team that they are uh, trying to get in place. Um, they've started down that path of building facilities and reassuring their um, that everything is right with you know the Monarchs or Swope Park on the Kansas City side, and so they've developed priorities. This what has happened with uh, FC Kansas City might create some urgency because we might have a situation within the next month or so uh, when the owners meet in Orlando around the final where Sporting Kansas City is going to have to face a decision. Do they want to take over or get involved with the team that's currently in market or see that team go away and then have to wait out expansion? Um, exp expansion is going to happen eventually. Um, there are a lot of teams on the, on the MLS side that remain interested. But as we talked about in the article today, the focus of the league has shifted to where they want to shore up the ownership that's in place now before continuing to grow uh, and get some kind of dis, uh, get some kind of firm ground for Kansas City. We mentioned Seattle. Seattle is losing a lot of money. Um, I think anybody who looks at that situation objectively could figure that out. Um, but the commitment of the Predmores isn't indefinite. I mean, spiritually it is, but eventually they're they're going to have to find a way to financially uh get on the get on the right side of the ledger and then the boston breakers is another team that multiple sources have told me has severe financial problems even beyond that i think there are long-term questions about two other teams chicago has to find a plan to get out of where they are now um they're not going away anytime soon but you can't look at the attendance numbers and um, everything else that's going around that team and say that this is a this is a team that can sustain like this indefinitely. And then Sky Blue also. I think Sky Blue is another team that falls into the smaller club category that needs to develop an infrastructure and a plan that will make them as viable in year eight and 10 as they were when the league needed them at the at year one. So just checking uh, back with some questions. Whatever happened with FC Barcelona, are they still interested in establishing an NWSL team? They are. Uh, Barcelona is interested. It, the interest just isn't as urgent as the last year of reporting has uh, indicated. They're not going to be coming in this year, possible next year. Um, there are a bunch of issues to sort out, but Barcelona is for real. It may never happen, but as of right now, the intent is to eventually get involved. Um, let's go to let's go to Twitter here really quick, uh, which I'll try to gracefully uh, switch to my laptop. Um, so, are are there other are there from other leagues? Would you like who would you like to see come play in the NWSL next season? Um, one thing that I always look at is I always look at England, and I see a lot of players who um, obviously they're not at Lyon and PSG making a ton of money, but between the cultural similar similarities between the two 
leagues and just some of the quality of players like Farrah Williams and Jill Scott and the point they're at in their careers and some of the experiences that we've seen people like Alex Scott and um, other players have here in the United States. I always look at the English league and wonder if the connection that England and the U.S. had during WPS was as strong. Who would I like to see over here? Um, we've, already, we've already had the virtue of Kim Little coming over and going back. But Jill Scott's on my mind because I've been thinking about all of the U.S.'s robust midfielders. And she's another example of a good, all-around, physically tenacious midfielder. And then Farrah Williams is just the type of player that I really like. So those two are the ones that immediately uh, jump to mind. Um, going back to Twitter, uh, what do you think is the top priority for the MWSL moving into 2018? Um, shoring up ownership. Um, I think at the beginning of the season, we would have said expansion and then maybe expanding some of the uh, expanding rosters, uh, getting bumping up pay a little bit more, uh, just basically quality of life issues or um, expanding career options for the players, basically trying to create an environment where players are more incentivized to stick around longer. Unfortunately, there are a lot of questions that still remain with some clubs, and that has to be number one. And amongst, uh, amongst the owners, I think there is a great divide. And on one side of that divide, there is, and we talked about this last week, on one side of that divide, there is a want to be more constrained in how the league is going forward. On the other side of the divide, there is the uh, want to continue to grow because the league is going to have to grow eventually anyway, and you can't wait around for these teams forever. Um, okay, uh, the question that everybody asks before games. We're, we're going to take a couple of more questions as we're already at minute 22. Um, if everyone on the current U.S. roster was in good health and their best form, who would you play in your starting 11 tonight and where would they play? Um, this isn't going to be too drastic because I think it's going to be somewhat similar to uh, what we saw on Friday. I would keep the midfield in place. I've already talked about how I like that midfield. Um, I would actually bring Casey Short back into the starting lineup. And I don't know if Kelly O'Hara is going to be good to go based on uh, her how we saw her leave Friday's game. But Kelly O'Hara Taylor, or Taylor Smith on the right. I keep the same center backs with Becky Sauerbrunn and Abby Dahlkemper. I do subscribe to the notion that getting them minutes together, um, they in some ways they are so similar. They need to figure out how to be different, um, if that makes sense. Um, in goal, I would put Ashlyn Harrison. I would give her a ch chance tonight. Um, up top, I would stick with Alex Morgan. I, I am a big believer in rewarding people's form in league, and that's part of the reason that I had Alex Morgan still lower on those forward rankings. I know that doesn't quite make sense, but I just, I'm just not ready to say if people have changed after only two months. But I would still reward them with playing time, and then I think Megan Rapino on one side, and I think there are a number of options on the other side. If they, if you gave Mallory Pugh another start, that'd be fine. I don't know if Rose Lavelle is there yet. Um, but I think, you know, you've got Crystal done too. So that's the 11. Um, let's try to find one more question here. And I really want to thank everybody for their, not only their questions, but the turnout and participation we got last week for the first time we did this chat was a lot more than we expected. We, we were kind of wondering, well, how many people are really going to turn up because we've never done this before? We didn't do a lot of promotion of it. And we eventually decided we have to start these at some point. But looking back at the engagement that we got last week, thanks a lot. I mean, it really makes this worthwhile, and we really appreciate it. Um, let me find one more question here from my timeline. Um, actually, let's okay. Let's do a question, and, and then we'll just go to a topic really quick. Um, from Sarah, does Cincinnati have any real NWSL ambitions? As an Ohioan, if FC Casey moved there, I would be smiley emoji. Uh, since the crew have no plans for Mojo. Sorry, Woso. Um, if, if, if it's entirely possible that can't, that Cincinnati has plans for women's soccer and I don't know about it. I'm not really connect, in, connected very well there. But they, in general, I like to think of it as, okay, the cost restrictions on this league are so low that if you have control over your facilities, you have an infrastructure in place, and that usually means having resources on the men's side so that you've stocked up your marketing and you've stocked up your um, your communications and your technical staff and your medical. You have all that taken care of. And you can draw a minimal number of people for three or 4,000. You're going to make money off this league. 
And that's really the divide between big and small in the NWSL. For some of these teams, it's just, it makes so much sense to have a women's team. And if you're in a situation like Portland when you can get 17,000 a game out, oh my gosh, you are going to, you're going to be able to benefit off the fact that cost has to stay low for every, these other teams in the league to compete. Even at Orlando, their numbers aren't as good as Portland's, but wow, I mean, like, it just doesn't cost that much to run one of these teams relative to some of these other commitments. So you look at somebody like Cincinnati, who I don't know what their lease situation is like with their current field. I know it's a shared use facility, but obviously they draw a ton of people. It would make sense to investigate that. There's a reason why four or five MLS teams continue to be interested in the NWSL. Um, so you can look at that same reasoning across the landscape and really ask, well, what other teams might be in a situation like North Carolina where they're second division on the men's side, but they can still support a women's side and it becomes a very good investment for them. Um, finally, the one thing I wanted to talk about is after uh, we released the article this morning about FC Kansas City situation, there's understandably a lot of pessimism about the NWSL out there. When you hear about the troubles in FC Kansas City, and then we also in that article felt that it was worth mentioning the troubles that are happening in Seattle, uh, Boston, and then in this chat we've mentioned Sky Blue and Chicago. So that's half the league right there. I don't think there is reason to be pessimistic about the league. You know, this also came up during last week's chat when somebody brought up uh, a tweet from Dan Laletta um, that was a little bit pessimistic, and I said I don't share his pessimism even though I kind of know what he's talking about. We're starting to see what that know what he's talking about is about. The reason I don't share that level of pessimism is, one, these problems are nothing new. All of these teams have had these issues from day one. Teams in other leagues have had these issues. Um, this is a reality of the women's soccer landscape. And the fact that the league has gotten two years past the benchmark from WUSA and WPS tells you that there's something about this league that is able to transcend these obstacles where the previous leagues weren't. And I think when I think about it, there are three main reasons for that. One, the commitment of U.S. soccer, which if this FC Kansas City situation uh, tells me anything, it's that it not only remains unwavering, but it's possibly going to be proactive in trying to solve these problems and not just stay on the side. Two, you have strong ownership groups, the MLS-affiliated ones, that really want this league to succeed. Uh, and they have the financial wherewithal to survive the ups and downs. And that's not that's something that just wasn't in place before. I would also say even though there is a divide in the ownership groups, even within that divide, there's a unity that we didn't see at the end of WPS. At the end of WPS, it was just chaos. Obviously, there was a very unique dynamic in there with Dan Borislaw coming into it. Um, by that time, teams had just checked out even at the beginning of that season. Um, we don't see that here. There's a lot of engagement. And no matter what side of the debate you're on, you don't have any teams. Most of the teams haven't just checked out. There is a robust and committed core of owners in this league who, while they might have differences, they are all committed. And then three, there is there is a high level of commitment from the players. Um, not only American players, we see the Australian players are very committed to this league, um, and we see players. We see more. We've seen two new Japanese excuse me, three new Japanese internationals, if you wanted to count Rumi Atsugi in there, uh, arrive in this league. We've seen um, increased players um, from Europe and other places come here. Um, so the player commitment to this league is also there. Um, so I, I'd already see, received a lot of DMs about this from people in the league at, after posting the article today. It is natural to look at that and be pessimistic about where the NWSL is. I would say that it's actually reason to be optimistic. Because even if the NWSL was in danger of losing teams, there are, there are teams lined up, there are, there are organizations lined up that still want to get into this league. Maybe not in 2018, or maybe the league wouldn't want them to get there in 2018, but they're going to want to get in after that. And you have people that really, even for the struggling teams, want to find a way to make it work. And those are things that just weren't there before. So I would actually look at the FCKC FC, FC news and see the silver linings of it um, in terms of potential solutions for a problem, whereas in previous leagues, when problems came up, there were no solutions. 
All right, everybody, we went a lot longer than my social media person wants me to, but hopefully you agree there were a lot of good things to talk about. I'm really sorry I didn't get to more of your questions because that's what this is really supposed to be about, and I'll try to improve on that. Uh, we're going to be back with you next week at the same time. We'll probably talk more about NWSL since that's gotten to play. Um, expect more news coming around uh, today's news to happen. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the women's national team because we'll want to talk about what we saw tonight. Again, I can't stress this enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you for turning out for this chat. And I look forward to talk to you again next week.